I'd like for you guys to take a look at this picture. Uh, this is a picture of the 10 virgins. And uh, share with me what you see that is different about this picture, maybe than any other picture you've seen with the 10 virgins. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Spiritual Survival Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Brown. Our team's mission is to help you have eyes to see the times we are living in, take unprecedented measures, and prepare yourself spiritually for the events that will precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. If the mission of our podcast resonates with you, please click subscribe, like, and share this content. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Spiritual Survival. I'm your host, Randy Brown. Uh, This week, I've had a a lot on my mind that I'd like to share, and I hope I can adequately uh, put it into words. I'd like to talk today about this question. And here's the question I'd like to ask, and uh, be sure to put your comments in the comment section, and uh, there'll be a a number of different questions that I'll ask today, and I would love for your input and some discussion. Uh, The first one is, will we have sufficient oil when the bridegroom comes? Um, I'd like for you guys to take a look at this picture. Uh, This is a picture of the 10 virgins. And uh, share with me what you see that is different about this picture, maybe than any other picture you've seen with the 10 virgins. So I'll give you a second to think about that and look at that. And again, write your comments down in the comment section. All right. Hopefully you've had a chance to do that. Um, Recently, I've learned something that was uh, very insightful about the parable of the 10 virgins. Um, by listening to Nelson Walters online. I don't know if any of you have uh, heard or seen of uh, Nelson Walters. Um, But what I've learned is that the word uh, in Greek that we translate into the word lamps in the King James Version of the Bible um, is lampa, which actually means torches. That really, really... uh, hit me because uh, a lamp and a torch are two very different things. And uh, as I've been pondering on this and and thinking about it actually in the temple, I've had some uh, thoughts and understanding kind of open to me that I'd like to share today and and kind of see what you guys think. Um, So the lamps that the 10 virgins, uh, the lamps of the 10 virgins are actually torches. And again, like I said, there's a big difference between a torch and a, and a lamp. And in the parable, it talks about uh, at midnight, the, the call came, um, you know, the bridegroom cometh. And so I've been thinking about uh, midnight and what that means. Um, midnight is usually the, the middle, and it's also uh, what, what we might think about as the darkest time of the night. And so at this darkest time of the night or this midpoint, uh, when this call comes to go out and meet the bridegroom, they, they, uh, they awaken, they light their torches, not lamps like the little lamps we typically think about. Um, and I think that's really significant because a, a torch can be a symbol of a, a testimony, not just a, a little uh, light of a testimony, but a flaming burning testimony. And uh, I thought of it as like the spirit of God burning in us. And this caused uh, caused me to kind of think even deeper. Uh, My wife and I were taking a trip this week down to the Payson Temple. We live in Bountiful. And uh, as I as we got in the car, I started thinking about this. And I the the words of the hymn, the spirit of God, like a fire is burning, came to my mind. And so when my wife got on the car in the car, I asked her to pull up the words um, from the hymn, The Spirit of God. 
And as she read them, it just, the spirit was just so powerful. And, and so I asked her to actually go on YouTube and, and open up the tabernacle choir singing this. And uh, it was, it was really powerful. I'm going to share a little bit of it here later in this particular episode. But it really hit me that the more oil we have, the more powerful the flame of our torch will be. And uh, this concept of this all taking place at midnight, um, you know, we're we're heading to that point. And this this will be the darkest time the world has ever seen. And uh, not only will we need to have torches, we will need to become torches. And that, I think, becoming torches is what really, really struck me this week that I'd like to talk about. Um, most of you know that my wife and I started studying Isaiah. It was, I, we started four years ago this month in March, right about the time of the, uh, the earthquake here in Utah and COVID shutting everything down. Um, but Isaiah, Isaiah teaches that those who become the 144,000, um, he's, he refers to them as servants or the kings and queens of the Gentiles, are those who ascend to the seraph level. Isaiah talks about seven spiritual levels. Um, and these, these seraphs are described in the scriptures as bright, burning, fiery ones. Um, and so my question, another question I pose is, were the, were the wise virgins, or maybe part of the wise virgins, those who had sufficient oil in their, for their torches, <laughs> that the Spirit of God was burning so brightly that they actually became seraph-level beings um, and, you know, ascended to the level that where they could become part of the 144,000. Um, so share your thoughts on that in the comment section. Um, here's a, a little uh, visual that I, I shared on another episode. It kind of shows the some of the different um, spiritual levels that Isaiah talks about, and once we reach the the celestial level, we have uh, the sons and daughters or servants, and right above that is the level of a seraph. And again, those are the ones that are described um, as being these fiery beings um, that they're just burning with light, and so it uh, it really resonated to me that this might be a deeper level of meaning that could be added to the parable of uh, the, the 10 virgins and who these five uh, wise virgins were. So it's amazing how uh, a little bit of a difference in translation of one word can put a whole new meaning on this amazing scripture. And as Latter-day Saints, you know, we, we love this part of, of the hymn, the spirit of God like a fire is burning where it says, and Ephraim, and I would say kings and queens of the Gentiles, will be crowned with his, Ephraim will be crowned with his blessings in Zion as Jesus descends with his chariot of fire. And again, there's the word, the word fire again. Um, this whole process is to prepare a people who will be able to go out in this darkest time the world has ever seen but do it in in power and great, great glory, or I might add fire. So again, uh, in Greek, which is the language this was translated from, um, there's the word lampa, which uh, would mean like a lamp, but the word used in the, the King James Version, um, or to translate into the King James Version was lampas, and that's the word that actually means uh, torches or torch. And then there's another word that's similar, lucina. And we're going to talk about what that means here in a second as well. So lampa would be a lamp, perhaps like uh, what we think about when we you know, see lots of pictures of the, these five wise virgins lighting their lamps and the, the unwise not having uh, sufficient oil. But... Where I want to go with this today is this actually meaning uh, lighting their torches. 
And when you think about going out in this darkest time of the world, you know, a question I pose, you know, will, will we um, shrink during this darkest time of the world and, and not be willing to testify, not be willing to let our, um, have the spirit of God like a fire is burning inside of us? Or, or will we have have this spirit burning in us? We have sufficient oil that we are, we are just like flaming torches. So again, back to our picture here. Um, the difference between this and other pictures you've probably ever seen of the of this parable is that the five wise virgins are carrying torches. Well, actually, they all have torches, but the uh, the unwise, um, their torches begin to sputter, which is very unfortunate in the darkest time the world has ever seen. Um, to not be able to have this testimony just burning inside of you. And I believe this is what President Nelson is preparing us for. I believe that when, you know, when he said the need to have the the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost uh, is to have this, the spirit of God like a fire is burning. And so uh, the other one is Lucina. And I want to share some insights I've had on this. Um, this would not just be one light. And this maybe isn't the, the best picture. I was thinking maybe of the, the huge uh, uh, menorahs that were outside of the Jerusalem temple. Um, but anyway, it's, it's multiple lights, multiple torches, multiple fires burning, burning so brightly. <clears throat> and so this is the process of, uh, being born again, being, uh, receiving a baptism, a baptism of fire, fire and, um, fire and the Holy ghost are, are kind of metaphors. Also, oil uh, would, would be kind of a metaphor there. And so once we are born again, once we, we uh, come to Christ, we, um, once we've received, we know we've received a remission of our sins and, and we've, we've had our, uh, a new, we've received a new life and been changed by Jesus Christ, uh, we now are binding ourselves to him in covenant. And so I love this picture of, uh, you know, binding ourselves to Christ by taking his hand. Very, very, uh, you know, symbolic of what we learn in the temple. And so um, this song, the spirit of God like a fire is burning. You know, I was thinking about these early saints and the, the difficulties and trials that they went through. Um, and so and how maybe we have it uh, have had it a little too easy. Um, not in all ways. We, we have our struggles today, but. Um, I think I think we're heading into a time where we're going to have these same types of experiences like the saints had at the Kirtland Temple. Um, I love these these words from the hymn that says, "The knowledge and power of God are expanding; the veil or the earth is beginning to burst, that we through our faith may begin to inherit the visions and blessings and glories of God." And I. I think this is what the Spirit was teaching me this week about this this parable of the ten virgins, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we as we go through here. I wanted to share a little bit of uh, of this version of it sung by the Tabernacle Choir.
we'll stop there. But I, I think this song depicts so powerfully um, what many of us are going to experience still in our lifetimes. Yeah, the words, uh, Ephraim be crowned with his blessings in heaven as Jesus descends with his chariot of fire. Just rings so true to me. So um, so here on this, this particular uh, visual, um, this is kind of my depiction of uh, what the endowment teaches. Um, I think, uh, you know, down here, we start out at a telestial level when we're born into this earth. And this, this could be kind of where the, the foolish virgins remain, even though, you know, they may have received baptism. Maybe they um, really didn't seek to fortify their testimonies with the, to the point where they could say they had the spirit of God like a fire is burning. And then there's those who pass through the gate, which is Jesus Christ. Um, they have a spiritual rebirth. They know they've had a remission of their sins. Their life is changed. And we would say that they are uh, in a state of being justified or they're righteous. Um, and they can remain in that state as long as they are continually repenting and staying in the covenant. I would say that that, uh, that level, that, that initial level of righteousness through the spirit would be equivalent to um, the lamp maybe that we we typically think of when we think of the this parable and who the who the five virgins were the five wise virgins but uh, in the endowment we learn that we can be clothed in power yeah actually there's a there's an ascension of clothed in righteousness and then in power and power might be uh, synonymous with uh, having having the spirit of god like a torch so moving from righteousness to power and then, uh, you know, as we ascend in this sanctification process with the Holy Ghost working in us, um, we're, we're ascending into like a higher level of flame, a higher level of burning light until we actually um, receive a second comforter and, uh, you know, come into a, a, a celestial level. And this would be the seraphs or the fiery burning ones. These will be the ones that will become part of the 144,000 and that will go out during this darkest time with such power and great glory and 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 bring people out of uh, terrible situations to Zion. And so this I would uh, equate to, you know, a, a lamp with just multiple lights. Um, I wanted to get, a again, a better picture, but that's the best I could find, so... Um, so as we think about these uh, these ten virgins, another question I would pose is, are we living up to our privileges? President Nelson has talked about, um, he's asked this this question, uh, or he, I think he stated it as, I, uh, I think there's many of us that are not living up to the privileges that can be ours. Um, and these privileges that are higher blessings, but it takes us ascending in, in the spirit. Uh, from a lamp to um, a torch and to uh, finally becoming uh, becoming fiery ones ourselves. So I wanted to, to bear my testimony. Um, I my testimony is rooted very strongly in a um, a powerful witness of the Savior Jesus Christ and what He's done in my life and. In the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I have a powerful witness that, that Christ's church has been restored on the earth. And I have a, a powerful witness of President Nelson as our prophet, seer, and revelator, and president, presiding high priest, and president of the church. And since he's been the prophet, he has said such miraculous things that in my eyes are, are specifically to prepare us with this process of ascending in the fire of the spirit uh, to become celestial beings, to be pre a people prepared to welcome him in his coming and a people prepared to go out and gather Israel in power and great glory. And so two of the things that he has said 
that have had the most impact on me are um, hear him and seek to be taught by the Lord himself. Um, I just think that that is so, so prophetic and so important for these times to have the spirit with us that we can be actually taught by the Lord himself, that we can be taught deeper and deeper things so that we can um, ascend in this flame of the spirit. And uh, I, I suppose the third thing that's had the most impact on me is when he said, take unprecedented measures. And uh, that's pretty much what led me to actually have the courage to begin sharing my testimony online like this. But my purpose in these uh, episodes is to discuss the topics uh, that support everything President Nelson is warning us of, um, especially as it pertains to surviving spiritually in the days that we are in and the things coming. Um, and having eyes to see. You know, I, I love that phrase, eyes to see. I think since 2020, um, I've had eyes to see at a different level than I've ever had in my life. And, you know, eyes to see things that have been prophesied in the scriptures, um, to see types as I read the scriptures, like in Isaiah, John, Nephi, Jacob, Mormon, Morona, they all use types um, that prophesy of our day, the time we're living in. Um, we live in a time where access to spiritual knowledge is greater than any time in history. But I wonder sometimes if, even though we have access to it, how many of us are actually using it and, and, and having, you know, do we have eyes to see as we, as we utilize it? Um, we live in a time where we have access to more tools for searching the scriptures than ever before. But do we have the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of revelation and the spirit of discernment? All these things come through this gift of the Holy Ghost um, that we need to be ascending in. Are we living up to our privileges to know the words of Christ? And... My patriarchal blessing that I received when I was 15 told me that I would <clears throat> that I would come to know the deeper things of the gospel so that I could bear testimony of them and to be valiant in that testimony. Um, so a couple of other questions I would pose to, to the listeners. <sighs> Christ spoke in parables. And obviously, <laughs> those are his words. And, and parables have multiple meanings and, and different layers of understanding. So um, are, are the multiple meanings in the parables all the words of Christ? Think about that. Think what that means. Are the deeper layers of prophecy the words of Christ? For instance, in the book of Isaiah, um, Isaiah wrote in a way that it's to be understood at different levels. Are each of those levels the words of Christ? Is, is personal revelation the words of Christ? When, when the Lord speaks to you personally. Um, is it doctrine? And I've, I've grappled a little bit trying to understand exactly what that word means, doctrine. Um, and uh, the question I, I pose to you, the listener, is, is doctrine the same as the words of Christ? Um, I've had people tell me I was, <laughs> was saying things that are false doctrine. And I've had to, to uh, pose the question, what is doctrine? Um, is it just the very, very basic things we might get in Sunday school class? Um, just because we haven't heard something in Sunday school, does it make it false doctrine? And I would say no. <laughs> um, and and I, I'll show that here, hopefully, in the, in the time remaining. Um, so are there words of Christ that are only meant for those who have eyes to see? Think about that one. And ears to hear and hearts to understand. 
Is there a level of doctrine? Is there a, a level of the words of Christ that are for that are for those who are the elect, those who are searching? Um, here's a verse from First uh, Nephi chapter eleven. For it came to pass that after I, after I had desired to know the things that my father had seen, and believing that the Lord was able to make them known unto me. So here's Nephi. His father was a, a prophet, a visionary man. And Nephi did not want to just rely on that. He wanted to know for himself. He desired these things. And he believed that the Lord is able to make them known unto him. Is, is that the case for us? You know, do, do we only... Um, receive just what's been given in a Sunday school manual or um, over the pulpit. Um, Nephi continues, as I sat pondering in mine heart, I was caught away in the spirit of the Lord, yea, into an exceedingly high mountain, which I had never before seen, and upon which I never had before set my foot. I testify that we can be caught away in the spirit. We may not be lifted up on a mountain, but I testify that uh, you can be sitting in the temple and caught away um, in your thoughts, in your, your spiritual, um, be given spiritual eyes to see things that uh, you can't get otherwise. Um, this is from Ether 4.15. Behold, when ye shall rend that veil of unbelief, which doth cause you to remain in your awful state of wickedness and hardness of heart and blindness of mind, then shall great and marvelous things, which have been hid up from the foundation of the world, be made known unto you. So what is the veil of unbelief? Do we have that? Are we guilty of that? As active, uh, striving members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, do we have veils of unbelief? And are there great and marvelous things that have been hit up that we are not currently accessing? Another question I'll pose. Do, you, do we understand the manner of prophesying amongst the Jews? Um, this is something that's talked about in the Book of Mormon. And I think without getting a little bit of a grasp on this manner of prophesying amongst the Jews, how they wrote, um, we, we won't be able to fully do, the, do this. And so here's a little bit of an example. And the question is, at what levels are the scriptures considered doctrine? So um, the ancient Hebrew prophets would write um, in ways that there were multiple uh, layers of meaning. And so, for example, uh, they, they call this first level pshat which would be just a simple level or a, a, a plain sense level, you know, reading it um, kind of as a history. And uh, I think a lot of people, when they read the scriptures, that's kind of about the level they read at. Um, but there's a, another level that's deeper, remez, which is um, searching the text for types and allegories and, and uh, singing it at, at a, another level deeper and then the third level is drash which means searching this is actually what christ has commanded us to do to search for instance the he, he commands us to search the words of isaiah and this is kind of where that manner of prophesying of the jews comes in um, we have to learn to see things like chiasms and parallelisms um, to really see what the the uh, prophet was saying when he wrote this and what he's prophesying of is the manner of prophesying amongst the Jews is they don't just say, hey, this will happen on this day. Um, they say it in types and and, and using literary uh, structures that if you know what the structure is, you can see exactly what the prophet is saying. And then there's the sowed level. This is the a hidden level. Um, it would probably, we would call this the mysteries. Um, and this really is the level we're supposed to be pursuing, but unfortunately, a lot of people think that we're not supposed to. And so I want to address that a, a little bit. Um, so again, these are the, the four layers, simple hints, searching, hidden meanings. Um, Third Nephi 28, this is uh, 
the Savior speaking. And he said, if he had all the scriptures, which give an account of the marvelous works of Christ, you would, according to the words of Christ, know that these things must surely come. I think the important thing is here is if he had all the scriptures. So is there doctrine we don't have? Is there Are there scriptures we don't have? We know there is. There's the the sealed portions of the Book of Mormon that are yet to come forth once we've uh, shown enough faith in what we already have. So again, um, is the surface level all that we should seek? And if we're doing that, are we are we living beneath our privileges? Um, so again, surface level or going deeper and deeper till we can know the mysteries contained there and and uh, practice what President Nelson's teaching us to be taught by the Lord himself. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, therefore I was taught somewhat in the learning of my father. And having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days, yea, having had a great knowledge of the goodness and the mysteries of God. So Nephi wasn't just searching the scriptures at the, the surface level. Um, Nephi was, uh, oh, I can't think of the word, um, highly favored. He was highly favored because he had this type of a spirit. Um, so is there more to doctrine that ju than just what is in the scriptures? What about the endowment? Um, the endowment, I think, is a perfect example of what we're talking about. Do we, do we go to, to the temple and just try to get the surface level? Or are we actually seeking to know the, the deeper meanings and the mysteries contained therein? This is uh, from President Nelson. This was in General Conference. I urge you to stretch beyond your current spiritual ability to receive personal revelation. For the Lord has promised that if thou shalt seek, thou shalt receive revelation upon revelation. How many of us are doing that, receiving revelation upon revelation? Knowledge upon knowledge that thou mayest know the mysteries. So President Nelson is telling us. Um, I hear people at church say we shouldn't be seeking the mysteries, but here's our prophet saying that we should know the mysteries and the peaceable things and that which bringeth joy and that which bringeth life eternal. And again, if, if we're not doing this, are we living below our privileges? Are we um, at risk of being amongst the, the five unwise virgins? President Nelson goes on, oh, there's so much more that your Father in Heaven wants you to know. Elder Neil A. Maxwell taught, to those who have eyes to see, let me see that term again, eyes to see and ears to hear, it's clear that the Father and the Son are giving away the secrets of the universe. So what about personal revelation? Should we just be seeking the bare minimum personal revelation, just, you know, I know the church is true. I know the Book of Mormon is true. Or should we be seeking to receive this level of revelation that President Nelson is talking about, to know the mysteries, to know the peaceable things? DNC 7610, For by my spirit will I enlighten them, and by my power will I make known unto them the secrets of my will. Yet even those things which I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man. So, you know, are we the, the ones that say, that's not doctrine, I've never heard that before. Um, the secrets of his will are things which I hath not seen, and, and nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man. These things are, you know, Joseph Smith told us, these things are intended for us if we'll pay the price. What about books like the book of Isaiah? Um I've just come to love Isaiah so much in these last four years and just see it as absolutely vital for being prepared for the the things we're, we're going into, this darkest time the world has ever seen. I see it as absolutely vital to um, have testimonies that are like torches and to ascend to the level where we can be like fiery burning ones, seraphs, and... Uh, 
but I see so few people that will uh, take the commandment of Jesus Christ to search the words of Isaiah for greater the words of Isaiah. Third name, 5.23.1. And this is the Savior speaking. And now behold, I say unto you that ye ought to search these things. You ought to search these things. A commandment I give unto you that ye search these things diligently. And there are tools. There are tools to be able to know exactly what Isaiah is saying and to see it at different levels. Uh, for great are the words of Isaiah. They're great because they contain mysteries. And they're mysteries that are hidden from, from those who won't seek. Um, what about parables? We, we just talked about the parable of the, of the ten virgins. And, uh, you know, you can read that parable probably on many different levels as well. Um, but I think the, the one I stumbled onto this week was uh, a very enlightening one that uh, those who have sufficient oil will will be able to be amongst those who are the kings and queens of the Gentiles and ascend and, and be servants of God on a, a very high level uh, with the power of God and great glory and uh, be crowned with Ephraim. So the spirit of God, or I could say the spirit of God like a fire is burning, is the spirit of prophecy. Um, the Book of Mormon has that term, the spirit of prophecy, many, many times. Um, the spirit of prophecy is our testimony of Jesus Christ. And, and that comes as we, as we experience being born again and as uh, we gain a testimony of the remission of our sins. Uh, we've received the gift of the Holy Ghost. We've had a, a mighty change. Um, but from there, the, that flame can increase to a torch from just a little lamp. And it can increase to where we are, these uh, fiery lamps ourselves, fiery uh, torches ourselves. And it's going to determine our experience in the end time. So the spirit of prophecy, do we just want to have a little bit of that? Or do we want to have it in its fullness? Spirit of prophecy is knowing that Jesus is the Christ. But that knowing can be at higher and higher levels until we're in his presence. So as, uh, as I thought about it this week, I think we could also include in the definition of the spirit of prophecy is having eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand having the eyes of our understanding opened to see and understand prophecies of Jesus Christ in scripture. Uh, there's, there's prophecies of Jesus Christ that these Hebrew prophets have, have left for us, but they have uh, to a certain extent hidden them in, in deeper layers. Um, having eyes to see the manner of prophesying amongst the Jews. I think it's very important. Um, having eyes to see the types and the patterns and being caught away in the spirit. Each of us have that privilege to be able to experience that. And on this podcast, we've talked that uh, we are, we are entering the period of the tribulations, especially for here in America. And as we do this, will you be, you know, will we be silent and will we not testify? Will we, we, shirk that um, because of fear or will our testimony burn like a fiery torch and this is from president nelson in 2016 a talk called the price of priesthood power in a coming day only those men who have taken their priesthood seriously by diligently seeking to be taught by the lord himself i think this applies to women equally as much as to men this responsibility to be diligently seeking to be taught by the Lord himself will be, be able to bless, guide, protect, strengthen, and heal others. Last week when uh, Phil Wright was on, we talked about this faith, not only to be healed, but to heal others. And there may be times when uh, women are, are not with a priesthood holder, Um but that, that same priesthood power is available to them. 
Only a man or woman who has paid the price for priesthood power, if priesthood power is available in the endowment, will be able to bring miracles to those he or she loves and keep his or her marriage and family safe now and throughout eternity. So as each of us uh, plant this seed of Jesus Christ in our hearts and nourish it, um, we'll see it grow. And uh, it, it just kind of similarly to how uh, we progress in light and knowledge and from a, a small flame to becoming fiery beings, this is a, an incredible process of uh, being sanctified by the Spirit. So hopefully this made sense and uh, will be valuable to some of you. I look forward to seeing your comments and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for being with us on the Spiritual Survival Podcast. Again, if the mission of our podcast resonates with you, please click subscribe, like, and share this content.